Friends, welcome back to the man's. Thanks for joining us tonight for our Tuesday evening sermon. And my thanks goes out to James Faulkner for organizing and leading our Tuesday evening praise during my time off and following on after Easter as well. Thank you, brother. I know that a number of people really appreciated that opportunity and likely we'll see it come again, uh, maybe during the summer, maybe before then, who knows. Uh, stay tuned and you'll hear more in due course. So tonight, Tuesday evening sermon, the aim is to dig deeper into God's word, to dig deeper into the passage we looked at on Sunday morning, Psalm 16. And so tonight we're going to turn there once more. And then afterwards, there's the opportunity to reflect and discuss. And you can go to the sermon page on our website and download some discussion questions there or questions for just your own personal reflection. But you can also join us on our Facebook page where we have an event for tonight, uh, Tuesday evening sermon discuss. And there, alongside others from the church and beyond, you can ask your questions, you can respond to some questions that are there, share your thoughts, uh, share your ideas, share your experiences that you might be encouraged and be an encouragement to others. So join us if you're able to stay on for that. So let's turn to God's Word. Open your Bible, open your Bible app if you've got that with you. And let's turn now to Psalm 16. And we hear once it read once again for us by Billy Rankin. Psalm 16 Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading from his holy word. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength, and our Redeemer, blow through this time, Lord. Come afresh amongst us and aside us, that we may hear your voice this night as we dig into your word. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Friends, in tonight's sermon, I'm going to focus much more on the remaining verses of the psalm. Then come back to some of what I shared on Sunday because the All Age message really focused much more on verses 1, 2 and 7. Nevertheless, the, the theme of, of trusting God even in the dark nights will be the core of our reflections tonight because this psalm is, is all about trusting God beginning in verse 1 and then detailing that through the other 10 verses. I think what this psalm teaches us throughout, through the life and experience of David is that trusting is having our identity in God, verses 3 to 6. Trusting is also having our hope in God, verses 8 to 11. And finally, trusting is living consciously before God, as we saw on Sunday. So let's turn to verses 3 to 6. Trusting is having our identity in God. This psalm is identified as a miktam, a form of prayer. And most of these have a description that tells us 
they were written whilst David was fleeing as a fugitive from Saul. So it's highly likely that this Psalm 2 was written during this period of David's life, a time when, when he had to live in the wilderness far from home, far from the land of his forefathers. Now, every Israelite clan was secure in their possession of a portion of the land with clear boundary lines determined by the throwing of the lot. And this was seen as their inheritance in the promised land. As such, we need to be mindful of this when we hear verses 5 and 6 which said, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. So the language here would normally be understood in terms of the land and, and how it was apportioned and, and valued. But remember... The circumstances David finds himself in here. He is without land, without home, driven away, likely never to return. Normally this, this should lead an Israelite to be mournful, destitute, feeling cast adrift and uncertain of their, their life and value because theirs was an identity tied to the land, much more than, than any affiliation we might have in our day to our land, whatever our nationality. Yet this is not what we see of David. Instead, we, we see someone who now sees the Lord as his portion. The Lord is his inheritance. And in this, in God, David delights. Because trusting is having our identity in God. It is by losing that which would normally be of greatest value to an Israelite that David is then enabled to, to come into a deeper place with God, to have a greater depth of trust in God. As such, we, we read of, of David's resolve to trust only in the Lord, for he said earlier, those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. What David means by suffering here is unclear, though it could refer to realizing that these other gods are impotent and unable to fulfill the wishful hopes of their followers because they're not real gods. Nevertheless, David's resolve is to worship, to trust only the Lord. He will not participate in the ritual pouring and drinking of sacrificial blood within the false worship of these other gods. Neither will he call upon their names in prayer, ritual or rites. Instead, it is the name of the Lord, Yahweh, that will be upon David's lips alone. Even though at this time of his life, those around him encourage otherwise. We read about this in, in 1 Samuel, where it says, They have driven me today from my share in the Lord's inheritance and have said, Go serve other gods. This is what they told to David, go serve other gods, but David will have none of it, for he trusts in the Lord alone. And in the, the journey of losing his inheritance, this refugee finds in the Lord a, a greater refuge and inheritance than he ever knew before. In, in my devotions last week, uh, I use the Lectio 365 app. The, the writer said this, God's greatest gift is always, ultimately, simply himself. God's greatest gift is always, ultimately, simply himself. I wonder, is God so real to us, like he was to David, 
that we can affirm this notion. And so say with God, Lord, you are my portion and my cup. Or as our, as our version on Sunday said, you, Lord, are all that I need. You are my greatest gift. Have we come to that place where trusting in God means we have found our identity in Him, that, that He is our truest and best inheritance? This idea is echoed in the words of Robert Murray McShane, who said, What a man is on his knees before God, that he is, and nothing more. McShane knew that this life is fleeting. What we have here is here today and gone tomorrow. And so, like David, he also knew that it is what we have in God that lasts and is of eternal value. We are what we are in that secret place before God. So, are we a people who have our identity in God? Is He our portion and our inheritance? Do we find our security in the Lord? Or is our security dependent on things and circumstances. The words of David in this psalm testify that it is possible, even in the midst of really difficult times, times when, when those moments in our lives when everything is unstable and threatening, when, when all forms of security, normal security, fail and leave us without defence, even then, the Lord is still our portion, our cup, our future. And, and hopefully we recognise the worth of that, the worth of Him. And in case that sounds a bit hard to believe, in case that sounds trite or, or fanciful or a notion based on a comfortable Western white middle class life, then, then I encourage you to dig into the life and writings of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a Protestant Lutheran pastor and theologian during the Second World War. Due to his opposition to the Nazi regime, Bonhoeffer was arrested and executed in a concentration camp in the last month of the war. It is said of Bonhoeffer that even during the privations of the concentration camp, he retained a deep spirituality which was evident to other prisoners. Bonhoeffer continued to minister to his fellow prisoners. Payne Best, a fellow inmate and officer of the British Army, wrote this observation of him. Bonhoeffer was different, just quite calm and normal, seemingly perfectly at his ease. His soul really shone in the dark desperation of our prison. He was one of the very few men I have ever met to whom God was real and ever close to him. Bonhoeffer and David trusted the Lord. And part of that was finding their identity, their security in the Lord, even in the most desperate of times. And so they would not turn from him, though advice or circumstance might encourage otherwise. Because although their inheritance was unseen, it was not insecure. And though their portion was intangible, it was not unreal. The Apostle Paul says something quite akin to this in the writings to the Philippians where he said, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Friends, May we so grow in our trust of God. Maybe especially in these times, these dark nights we find ourselves in, that we too 
can reach that place with Paul, with David, with Bonhoeffer, that we also realize the worth, the inheritance we have in knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord, our God. And so through that trust, find our identity, our security in Him. Secondly, this example of trusting God involves having our hope in God. David wrote, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Trusting God is having our hope in God, maybe especially in the face of death. David speaks of the realm of the dead. In some translations, this phrase is given its technical name from the Hebrew, Sheol. It sounds strange to us, but that's because we may not realise that Israel's understanding of what happened after death was slowly revealed by God over time. There was progressive revelation. Nevertheless, they knew, even in David's time, that death is the opposite of life, and God is the source of life, and so to die, they thought, was to lose God, to lose his presence and the pleasures of his presence. Death wasn't simply about losing our present existence, the Hebrew understanding of death and its aftermath held out little or no hope of resurrection into new life, regardless of whether they were just righteous or wicked. That's part of the reason why in the New Testament, the Sadducees in Jesus, they held to the idea that there was no resurrection, but Jesus put them right when he said that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And so there will be a resurrection. Yet here is one of those signs that God by his spirit was revealing something through David, was inspiring hope of a future beyond death. This allows David to speak of knowing the Lord at his own right hand during this, his earthly life and so not being shaken, and knowing deep gladness and contentment. What is more, in the same psalm, David goes on to speak of a hope of knowing God beyond death by being at God's right hand for eternity, and so of knowing his presence and pleasures. Trusting is having our hope in God especially in the face of death. It was a trust also echoed in Jesus, who said with his last breath upon the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is a trust found also in the writings of Paul, who again said to the Philippians, for to me to live is Christ and to die is Again, to live now is to know Christ by his Spirit, for he is real, he is with us, he will never leave us nor abandon us, but to die is to go and be with Christ in person. This hope is only secure because of Jesus. The early church recognised that the, the language used here in Psalm 16 had to point beyond David because Peter, in, in his first sermon, recounted to his first Israelites these words. I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet 
and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Jesus alone was not left in Sheol. By his resurrection, he alone was saved the corruption of the body. As such, Jesus, our Lord, is preserved by God, given his eternal inheritance, and so he will never be moved nor shaken, for he, for him is secured from death and ushered into the presence of the Father where there is fullness of joy. But because of Easter, through faith in Jesus, we too can share in the victory of Jesus. And so the hope of Psalm 16 becomes our hope as we realize all we have through Jesus. Because trusting is having our hope in God. This Psalm is a really powerful but challenging prayer, spoken by a man under the influence of the Spirit, amidst uncertain times, dark nights, and yet it is infused with confidence and joy because David had learnt that trust in God is having our identity in God and it is having our hope in God as well. But how, how do we cultivate and sustain that kind of trust? Well, clearly the psalm doesn't have all the answers. Yet, as we saw on Sunday morning, it does give us some important ideas, which I'd like to draw upon again tonight. In the Ollie's message, I spoke of how thankfulness and praise help to keep our horizon filled with God. Because as we realise all that we have from our good Heavenly Father, His good gifts, and realise who He is and appreciate all that we have through Jesus, then then with thankfulness and praise, we, we keep our focus on God and sustain our trusting in Him. One commentator said, Trusting is not merely a warm feeling or a passing impulse in a time of trouble. It is a structure of acts and experiences that open one's consciousness to the Lord as a supreme reality of life. That's a bit of a weighty statement, but sometimes a meaty statement can feed our minds and and build our faith. Trust is a structure of acts and experiences that open one's consciousness. And we might say, keep open one's consciousness of God. As I said on Sunday, thankfulness and praise keep God at the centre. They keep him in focus by keeping us open to him and conscious of him. The great and terrible deception of the enemy is to turn our minds from God, to darken them and make us believe there is no God or that God is distant and uncaring. But with thankfulness and praise, we keep that from happening. We open and keep open our consciousness to God, our consciousness of God, so that we consciously live before him and with him, rather than God being an afterthought or put into his box and kept for Sunday. In the introduction to the reading on Sunday, I spoke of how Google searches for prayer are up significantly since the start of the pandemic. It would be good to pray that in the midst of this, people's consciousness of God would open such that they find him and come to trust in him. Yet, let's also pray that their consciousness stays open that they go on to live consciously with God for the rest of their lives, bearing a great harvest to his glory. And let's take note of that 
for ourselves as well. That we might be doers of the word and not only hear it. For thankfulness and praise are only a few ways given to us by God to help sustain this consciousness of him and keep him at the centre of her horizon and outlook. If you're looking for more ideas, you might want to review the sermon and material from March 17th last year. It's still on the website, by the way. Uh, you have to dig down a couple of the pages within the sermons. Uh, page, I think it's maybe page five or so. In that service, I, I, speak, I spoke on spiritual temperaments. And if you review the material, then you can figure out which temperaments match you. Because each one of us will have ways that help us more easily meet with God and keep us open to him and centred upon him. But I would also encourage you to, to try out the other temperaments as well, just in case you find a surprising new way of building and sustaining your trust in God by living consciously before him. In all of this, it's worth noting that David's difficulties did not vanish as he said this prayer. The insecurities of everyday life still remained for him and they do for us as well. Yet as we weave in thankfulness and praise to strengthen and deepen our trust in God, living consciously before him, we are then empowered by him to find the path of life, both within and through these painful times, even when we seem to approach the very gates of Sheol itself. I pray that we will be a people who keep trusting in these days by having our identity and our hope in God as we weave our rhythm of thankfulness and praise into our lives. May it be so. Amen. Friends, let us come before our good God in prayer. Let us pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we gather in our homes tonight, coming before you, seeking to live consciously before you, to know that you are with us and to make that known in our lives. And so we set aside this time, recognising that you are not boxed in to only Sunday morning. You are with us in every moment of life and to serve our consciousness and praise throughout the day and week. And so we gladly give you this time tonight. You are faithful God. You who are unchanging, the same yesterday, today and forever, with a love that will never leave us nor forsake us, generous by giving of your Son in sacrifice for us, that we might have a good hope and eternal encouragement to sustain us in the darkest of times. Oh God, how good you are and worthy of praise and we will be a people who praise your name and make you known in this generation and in the generations to come. Father, we pray that you would help us to be a people who trust you, who keep trusting you and enable others to come and trust you as well. Lord, may we have our identity in you. May we have our hope in you and may we sustain this trusting Lord by living consciously before you. Lord, I pray for any who may be in that dark night of the soul, that, that desert and wilderness place where you may seem distant, and I pray for that season to end 
I pray for you to break in with fresh life, with fresh presence and revelation, God. Pour out your spirit of wisdom and revelation upon them that they would know you close, Lord, that they would know this season is only for a season and journey with you, that you are still with them even in that time, that you will never leave nor forsake. But Lord, for all of us, deepen our trust, deepen our walk with you. Help us to to shape our rhythm, especially in these times, Lord, where where we can find ourselves in in one of two extremes. We can either be in the extreme of, of having lots of time on our hands, and so weaving time in with you is is maybe less difficult, but in some ways just as difficult because there are many other distractions things we might rather give our time to. And then, Lord, there's the other extreme where we are so busy that every moment is crammed and and sure, there are things we'd rather do, but there are things we have to do. And in both places, Lord, it is so easy to squeeze you out and not live consciously before you. Lord, Teach us, speak to us, refine us, that that we might find ways of living consciously before you, in the quiet or in the busy. Lord, in this time, we do continue to remember what is going on in our wider world world and in our nation and we pray for our leaders nationally and locally that they would have wisdom for the difficult decisions they have to make and we pray for your grace to be poured out upon us and a nation to sustain us in this difficult time to keep making good choices for the betterment of others, that we would be sacrificial, Lord. And so not do things that that would risk uh, impact upon our most vulnerable. Lord, we do pray for those working hard to find treatments and vaccines and we pray for you to bring clarity of mind, creativity, insight, understanding, Lord. Give fresh revelation, Lord, of how your world works and how this virus can be tackled. Lord God, we pray for the many frontline staff, so many professions we could name, Lord, but we ask for your hand of protection upon them to sustain them. And may their sacrifice, Lord, spur us on to care for one another and to give sacrificially in our own ways, whatever they may be, as we stay at home. Lord God, hear us now as we close our prayer in the words that Jesus taught his disciples to say as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Friends, thanks for joining us tonight for Tuesday evening sermon. We will be back on Thursday 
via our YouTube channel and a Jitsi room for Thursday evening live prayer. So please join us then if you're able. If you're unsure how to join us or if you want to give the Jitsi room a try, then go to our website and in the top left corner, you'll now see an option to click on something called COVID-19. And it's a section of our website where we've got resources, um, uh, things that we've emailed, posted on Facebook, posted out in, in the snail mail um, to, to those that don't have internet. So you can dig in there and within there, there are resources too on how to access the Jitsi room and how to access uh, YouTube, Facebook page, uh, etc. So please utilize that if you are of need and let others know if they've got any questions too. I am continuing to pray for you, for us as a congregation in our parish at this time. And I pray that in the midst of all that we are facing, we will be a people who keep trusting who know the Lord is near us even in these dark nights. Do get in touch with us if you need support or if you know people who need support, please call the church office. Make known your need or their need um, because we do have a pool of people who are ready to love their neighbour. And so as we go from here, may we go with Jesus going in his name and going with the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, this day and forevermore. Amen. Sing to the east and the west, Jesus is Savior.